Okay, I'm going to mute all of you. I'm going to start already. Uh, let me hold on. Uh. Mute mute la now. Okay. See? Oh, come on. Okay, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning service through Zoom. And also we want to welcome those who are watching from our Facebook uh, live stream. We want to welcome you this morning. Okay, before we begin, we're going to invite Brother Weishan for the scripture reading. Uh, Weishan, where are you? Let me see where you are. Let me spotlight you first. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll pass you. You uh, are. Uh, wait, 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 wait. I'll give you the slide first. Okay. But Go you ahead. are a choke. Go ahead. Yeah. Can start, David. But you are a chosen Jesus, hold a holy. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. First Peter 2 verse 9 to 10. Okay, thank you, uh, Brother Wishan. Let's open up with a prayer this morning. Father, we want to thank you this morning that we can come before your presence. Lord, we ask that you be with us this morning. We want to commit this service into your hand. We ask your presence to be with us. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you continue to, Lord, we, we continue to lift our voices to praise you. And during this time, Lord, we want to commit this time to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So I'll ask uh, Sister Jenna to lead us in the time of worship. Uh, good morning, church. Welcome to our online service this morning. Uh, let us just worship together uh, from our homes. <laughs> Your heart 
Jesus, I pray that you that you give us confidence, Lord, in our situation, whatever we are going through, that Lord Jesus, you are able to turn your wrong for good, Lord. And we just praise you and we glorify your name as we um, listen to your word. And I just pray that you will be received, Lord, in our hearts this morning, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we glorify you. Just that for you. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you, Sister Jenna, for the worship. Uh, we will just go through some announcements this morning. Okay, uh, this uh, Tuesday, we continue on with our uh, School of Discipleship on End Times. Okay, so uh, the Zoom ID is still the same, 851-8525-9319, passcode End Times. Okay, time is 8.30 to 9.45 p.m. So those of you uh, come in, please come in five minutes earlier so that I can uh, assign you to the breakout room. Now, those of you who haven't attended any of this uh, class is lesser if you want to sign in you still can sign in this uh, this uh, tuesday we are starting on lesson eight which is on the olivia discourse in matthew 24. Uh, stephen armstrong will share a little bit more detail 
that I mentioned last week, you know, a very brief, but uh, he will share a bit more detail uh, on this Matthew 24, the Oliver discourse. Okay, so we welcome all of you to join us on Tuesday. Next one is the prayer altar online on Wednesday and Friday. It's still ongoing. Uh, any one of you like to join us, uh, feel free to join us for the time of intercession and prayer at uh, 10 30 every Wednesday and Friday. Okay, the ID is. 899-6434-3880, passcode PA008. Okay, just a reminder, this coming Saturday uh, on 29th of May, Saturday, 3 p.m. is our servant leader Zoom meeting. Okay, uh, just a reminder, uh, the Zoom ID and the passcode will send to the chat, uh, chat group, the servant leader chat group later this week. Okay, so just uh, take note on this uh, Saturday meeting. Okay, we are continue our Zoom service uh, next Sunday, and uh, so it's a Zoom Zoom meeting ID is the same. Okay, eight four two three one four two two eight seven zero passcode FCD service, and also we also live stream to our Facebook channel, so you can still tune in in both uh, uh, methods. Okay, let's move on to tithes and offering. Uh, Malachi 3 verse 10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. You can do so through online bank uh, uh, giving to our May Bank, uh, FCD Bahad 51223151 So let's pray and uh, give thanks to the Lord for his providence to all of us and so that we're able to continue to give back to to the lord as a as a worship unto god father we want to thank you for your continuous faithfulness of providence to all of us even in this challenging time that we're living in that even as we uh, give back to a portion of all you have blessed us with that god to continue to Give it back to the storehouse that, Lord, you use it for the furtherance of the kingdom. Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus for your blessing for every individual, for every home, that you continue to bless them. They're going out and coming, especially during this time. Continue to watch over us, all of us, Lord, in your protection, the divine protection, Lord. Continue to bless us in good health and in strength in Jesus' mighty name. And all the people say, Amen. Amen. Okay, today we have uh, Sister Josephine, our Associate Minister, to come and share with us the Word of God. And uh, I'll pass this time to uh, Sister Josephine. No sound. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now okay. Yeah, sorry. I was just setting up my uh, slides. Huh? Uh, okay. All right, good morning. Uh, all my FCT family uh, and friends, those of you who are on Zoom and those of you who are on live stream. Uh, may God bless all of you at this time, a very challenging time. I pray for the peace of God to be in our hearts and uh, so that uh, we all can uh, sail through this period. Okay, um, shall we come to the Lord in prayer this morning? Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, I surrender this morning message into your hands. 
I pray for your anointing to be upon me so that I can speak forth your message with clarity and conviction. I pray in the name of Jesus that everyone will listen with an open heart so that the word of God will, will bring understanding and revelation that leads to transformation that your will be accomplished in our lives. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, this morning, I want to touch on a very serious topic. It's about being set apart. I will be referring to quite a few Bible references to help us understand this concept. Uh, let God's word speak for itself. Uh, please bear with me. I have been thinking why the Laodicean church in Revelation was accused of being lukewarm by our Lord. And Jesus says he will vomit her out of his mouth. When I think about this, this is frightening. I would sometimes even ask myself, Lord, am I lukewarm? Looking at the Laodicean church in Revelation 3, it is, really, is it really their wealth and their self-sufficiency that caused them to be lukewarm? Could there be any underlying factors like not being set apart that caused them to be lukewarm in the eyes of God? Yes, I say in the eyes of God. We need to know what God thinks of us. What is God's expectation of his church? I think it is only wise to find out what God expects of us. And then we live our lives according so that we will not be called lukewarm. Well, with this question in mind, I have entitled my message today as Redeem to be set apart for God. Do these churches obey the Great Commission and emphasize a lot on evangelism? And we tell the lost world of the good news in John 3, 16. And praise the Lord for the many souls that come into the kingdom of God because they have responded to the love of Jesus. They have repented and they have become part of this kingdom of God. Yes, we are part of this kingdom, spiritual kingdom of God. And thank God for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that guides us every day. Now here, we want to know what is God's expectation of his church. We might want to ask a question. Who are we in the eyes of God? With this, I go to the next section of my message. Who are we in the eyes of God? Have you ever paused and think of a question like, why did God save us and redeem us from the power of sin and death? Yes, we know God loves us and he doesn't want any man to perish under the judgment of sin. But is there more to it? Let us look at the scripture to see who we are in the eyes of God, and hopefully understanding God's expectation, we will be his pleasure. Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light, who once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You who had not obtained mercy before, but now you have obtained mercy. Now, most of us are familiar with these scriptures, but how many of us 
understand the significance of this scripture. Actually here, God is telling us who we are in his eyes. Yes, in the eyes of God, this is our identity. Our identity consists of four parts. We are first, his special generation of people. We belong to him. It's very important to know we belong to him. We are not our own. And the second point is, he has chosen or called us out to be. We are people chosen by God. He chose us, not we choose him. And the third point is the royal priest. We are the worshiper who serve him. And the fourth point is, we are the one that forms the holy nation of his kingdom. The word holy tells him that he expects us to live a holy life. And what is the point of having this group of special people? The purpose would be to declare his glory and his saving grace to the world, which is in the word to proclaim, to proclaim the, to proclaim the praises of him. So with this, we know that this is what God expect us to be. So we are to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and his own special people. But Apostle, Paul, uh, Apostle Peter is not the first person to describe the identity of Christian this way. From the Old Testament, we know that actually God has first chosen the Israelites to be his special people. We do not know why he chose the Israelites. This is God's sovereign will. But it has been observed in several occasions that God wants to establish his covenant with his chosen people. God himself initiated the relationship with Israel. Verse uh, Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6 say that this is what God has promised the Israelites while they were still in the wilderness. If, this is what God says, if, this is what God was telling Moses, huh? if they obey all his voice and keep his covenant, they will be a special treasure to God. And they shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, it is God's desire to have a kingdom of priests and holy nation. So, as early as the time of Moses, God already revealed his intention of having this special group of people to be his kingdom of priests and holy nation. Now, who are the chosen people in 1 Peter 2.9? They no longer refer to the Israelites. In fact, today, God has chosen everyone who received Jesus Christ as their personal savior. It can be the Jews, it can be the Gentiles to be that special people to form this kingdom of priests and holy nation with Jesus as the king. Here, I want to focus on two words in the scripture, chosen and holy. Are you aware that God sees us as his chosen to be holy people? Not just chosen, but holy. So right from the very beginning, it has been God's intention to set apart this special group of people so that they are the holy people to show the nations of the world that this group of people are different. Initially, it was the responsibility of the Israelites to show forth his glory, but they failed. So now the responsibility 
falls on the church. We are now that chosen people set apart from the world unto God with the purpose of proclaiming his glory. Ephesians 1 verse 4 tells us that God has actually chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So God wants us to be a holy and blameless people before him. Now, let us go back for a moment, back to the story of the Old Testament and see how God actually has dealt with his chosen people, the Israelites. When God gave instructions to the children of Israel through Moses, on how they should live their lives on earth. He clearly emphasized that they should be separated from the unclean. He has repeatedly emphasized the fact of separation and being holy. It is almost like an exhortation, a, a command. In Leviticus 20, 24 and 6, he says, God says, I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the people. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the people that you should be mine. And he went on to say that you have to consecrate yourself and be holy because I am the Lord your God. This instruction is repeatedly mentioned to the Israelites when they were in the, Israel, uh, in the wilderness. But later, it was also recorded in Deuteronomy when the new generation of the Israelites were about to enter the promised land. And Moses again reminded them who they are in the eyes of God. And this is what Moses telling the new generation. He says, you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and you are his treasured possession. He emphasized that they were chosen by God. And again, in Deuteronomy 14, 2, you have been set apart as holy to the Lord your God, and he has chosen you from the nations of the earth to be his own special treasure. I seem to be repeating the same idea. But why do God repeat this to the Israelites? Why do the Israelites need so many reminders from Moses? This is because soon they were going to claim the promised land. And they were going to encounter, to face the heathens who were in the promised land. And these heathens are the people who worship other gods and their lifestyles are not acceptable by God. Of course, sadly, in spite of all the many reminders, history tells us that they have forgotten or they have neglected who they are and they did not pay attention to God's instruction. They became no difference from the unclean heathens around them. The Israelites actually took assumption of who they are. Oh, we are God's people. That's what they say. Yet, they did not take heed to God's instruction to be separated. And they allowed themselves to be influenced by the heathens, heathen world around them. Despite the many warnings from the many prophets sent by God, they were oblivious and remained disobedient. Ultimately, they lost their promised land, they lost the holy city, Jerusalem, and the holy temple to the enemies. And they themselves were dispersed to other nations as captives. This is the consequence of not paying heed to God's instruction. I hope Christians today take note of this lesson lest we forget who we are and also do not take heed to God's instruction. So by now, we have answered the question of who we are in the eyes of God. 
from God's perspective, we are his people chosen by him to be set apart for him to proclaim his glory. Similarly, Jesus came 2,000 years ago and completed his mission on earth. He has offered to the world the good news of salvation together with the instruction on how Christians should live their life as the chosen people, the church. So at this point, I would like to ask a question. How did we, the church, respond to both the offer of good news of salvation and the instruction to live a holy life? We happily and gratefully receive the gospel, but do we take the instruction of being set apart seriously? Most of us are not so particular, I use the word, not so particular about the instruction to be set apart. And this is why I am led to ponder and think. This is something that we should ponder. Actually, we should be serious about this and ask ourselves, are we who we should be in the eyes of God? If we survey churches today around the world, how many churches have been influenced by the world? How many world values have crept into the church subtly? The world is becoming increasingly a place of accepted immorality and violence. And worse, the image of our God in the Bible, our Jesus Christ, our Holy Spirit, these are all being blurred by the world. In fact, the world, together with the so-called worldly Christians and false Christians, are actually waiting for Jesus to be reduced to merely a historical figure. Because the deity of Jesus has been questioned, debated, mocked, and joked by today's world. Obviously, Christians' influence over the community and society has been reduced tremendously in the last century. How many churches today still remain steadfast to the full teaching of the Bible? How then can a church be effective for the gospel if the Christian community is seen or deemed no difference from that of the world? How can we proclaim the gospel to the lost world if they see us no difference from them? We are supposed to be the salt and the light to the world. What is the use of the salt if it has lost its flavor and effectiveness? So, my dear brother and sister, in a world of cultural Christianity, we, the true Christians, need a very clear understanding of who we are in Christ and the expected responsibility upon us. God redeemed us as his special people to show forth his glory to the lost world. So we have been redeemed, not just only for eternal life, but we have been redeemed to be set apart by God for his purpose and glory. Now, I have finished this section. I will go on to the next section. I will look into the New Testament to see how God continued to exhort his people to be set apart for him. The exhortation that can be found in the New Testament the apostles and the disciples of Jesus continue to teach and urge the followers of Jesus Christ to live their life set apart for God. Yes, God has set apart his church. God knows the world we live in is evil and corrupted. Even Jesus himself, when praying to the Father for his disciples, this is how he prayed. In John 17, 15, 18, Jesus prayed, I do not ask that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. 
They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus knows the kind of world we are in. And he is interceding continuously for us. We Christians live in this world, but we are not of this world. This is an evil world under the rule of Satan, who is ever ready to pull men away from God. Satan is always there attacking men and women of God, especially through the temptation into the most vulnerable areas, which is the last of the eyes, what we see around us every day, and the last of the flesh, or oh, what our hearts desire all the time, and the pride of lies, which is the most common pursuit of most men, including Christians. The last of the eyes, the last of the flesh, and the pride of life. They continue to be the temptation that stumble many of us, if not causing us to fall away. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 16, Apostle Paul was urging the Gentile believers to come out from their own lifestyle. It is so important. Why? He highlights to them the difference between the lives of the believer and the non-believer. In fact, he asked them not to be e and not to be unequally yoked with the unbelievers. He says that there is no partnership between righteousness and lawlessness. Neither is there any fellowship between light and darkness. He was reminding them that we are the temple of the living God. So we should set apart ourselves for God. Then in verse 17, he quoted God's instruction to them. He says, therefore, come out, come out from among believers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. This is a strong command from Jesus. In fact, to me, the strongest warning would be what we read in Revelation 18, 4. John heard this. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people. Come out of her. Come out of the world, my people. This is what Jesus is calling. So that you will not share in her sins. So that you, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. This is a warning that there are consequences to be considered if we do not come out from the world. When we allow the world values to influence us while we are worshipping God, it would probably end up like serving two masters. And we are warned not to serve both God and mammon. Mammon is the God, the false God of money, materialism, and worldly gain. If we are not careful, this temptation of the world will blur our focus of worship, especially when we are already infatuated by materialism and the pursuits of life. Actually, at this point, I'm very tempted to go back to what I mentioned in the very beginning about the Laodicean church. There is nothing wrong being wealthy, but could it be? I say, could it be? Huh? I'm not sure. Could it be the pursuit of wealth have led this Laodicean church away from their dependency on God and affected their relationship with God? And their lives are tempted so much by the world that they no longer worship God alone. They are actually lost in worshipping the other idols of the world. This world is full of temptation. And it is so easy to be infatuated 
by his glamour. Could this be the reason why the Laodicean church is being labelled as lukewarm and spit up by Jesus? Oh my God. On one hand, they are worshipping the Lord. The other, the gods of the world. So in the end, they are neither here nor there. Well, I do not know whether this is the reason for their lukewarmness, but I'm very tempted to think that this is. I will leave you to decide. Peter continued to urge Christians to be holy. In 1 Peter 1.15, he says that, because your God who call you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. It is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. This is certainly a command. You shall be holy. We have to be serious about being set apart to be holy. Now, do you see the many commands in New Testament that call us Christians, the church, to be set apart for God? Well, this, I have finished this section and we'll move on to the next question, a popular question. How to be set apart for God? The Bible gives us many instructions on how we should live. Colossians 3, 10 tells us in Christ, we have become a new person and this new person is continually renewed in knowledge to be like his creator. Continually renewed in knowledge means we continually to receive teachings and revelations from God so that we allow God to change us to be like our creator, our Jesus Christ. So what we learn today about being set apart from God's perspective, I hope it should help us to change our attitude and to be serious with God. And when Paul, he tells the, the, the Galatians in Galatians 2.20, he says that our old sinful self have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer we who live, but Christ live in us. Yes, today we don't belong to ourselves. We should be living for Christ. Now, this is a serious topic. Being set apart from the world doesn't mean that we cannot have fun. But of course, we are told not to indulge in the sinful activities of this world. Now, for these sinful activities, there are so many listed. I shortlisted a few. Let's look at them. Do not love the world or the things in this world. In fact, we should flee from the evil desires and pursue what is righteousness, faith, love, and peace out of a pure heart. We should not take part in the unfruitful work of darkness, like uh, dealing with witchcraft, divination. And interestingly, he says here, we must not follow the group, the crowd in wrongdoing. If people do wrong, we don't have to follow them. It's not, it's not the majority issue here. We have to know what is right and wrong. And furthermore, he warn us against perverting the justice of lawsuit. And most important, we should all abstain from sexual immorality and put away all the malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Well, there seems to be so many instructions, but we all know the fallen nature in us, the weakness in our flesh. How then do we remain holy and set apart for God? Paul in Galatians 5.16 says, Walk by the Spirit 
and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. God is so good. He didn't leave us on our own to fight this battle. He is helping the Holy Spirit in us to guide us. And he goes further on to advise us that we must learn to conform our mind to the mind of Christ. This is because our thoughts and attitude actually reveals our heart and eventually determine our action. So to set apart for God, we should start with our heart, our attitude first. And Paul has suggested the best way to be set apart for God is to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice unto God. Actually, I used to come across, I used to be uh, very apprehensive when I come to this verse. How do I offer myself as a living sacrifice? I don't have to die on the altar. Let's look at it. Let's read Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, it's an appeal to who? Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. It is a reasonable service to God. And do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. Well, Paul is asking believers to offer our lives as living sacrifice unto God. We are to die to self, the fleshly nature of us, and live for God every moment of the day. We are to give our entire being, all our hearts, our love, our talents, our energy, and all our strength as sacrifice in serving him. We serving him, we serve him by dying to self. That means we do not want our will to go on, but we allow God's will to be done in our life, especially in every decision we make in our lives. Yes, let us be always mindful of the leading Holy Spirit over our fleshly desire every time we make decisions. We can hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit telling us what is of Him and what is not of Him. And let God's will be done in every decision we make. By doing so, we are sacrificing ourselves we put to death our fleshly desire. Well, we can sacrifice so many things. Just to list a few. Well, uh, we can sacrifice some opportunity for extra income so that we have more time to serve up, to, to available to serve God. We can sacrifice some sleep to read God's word. We can sacrifice some comfort and popularity when we share the gospel. Even though it is the uncomfortable, we can still sacrifice this discomfort and be bold to share the gospel. We can sacrifice that kind of uncomfortable feeling. We can sacrifice hobbies. Some of us, some of us we have a lot of hobbies. Especially, we should not even allow the sinful hobby to continue. We should sacrifice this in order to be holy and to be spent to and to spend time in God's presence. Well, the set the, the list of sacrifices can go on, but the most important is we must understand. As long as we are willing to be obedient to God's instruction, the Holy Spirit will lead us step by step in the sanctification process, and little by little. The little sacrifice we make to obey his will are actually the practical, are actually the practice of selflessness 
which will be seen as the living sacrifice in the eyes of our God. Every moment of our day, we can offer up our service of worship unto the Lord. So all these decisions we make, every word we say, every decision we make is an offer of worship unto Him. So when we speak kindly, instead of lashing our anger, allowing the flesh to have its way, when we speak kindly, we don't complain, we don't judge. These are all little acts of worship unto the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I think we should regard all these little living sacrifice as a spiritual worship to our God. So, in conclusion, we now know it is God's intention for the church to set apart as a group of people chosen by him to be his holy worshiper, to show forth his glory to the world. And God is very serious about separating us from this fallen world. I think we should, in appreciation of the grace and the goodness of God, we should obey his command and be serious to live for him. Christians should set apart for God and live up a life of worship to God through the daily personal sacrifice and holiness. But of course, we have our carnal nature, and many of us fall short of God's expectation. Let us then humble ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us step by step on this path of sanctification. It takes time so that we can overcome the many temptations of the world and truly be the holy and blameless people God intend us to be. Let us close in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before your throne of grace. I thank you for this message because you loved us. You have come to warn us and to remind us to be a people set apart for you. We ask for forgiveness that we have not taken this instruction seriously so many of our times. Father, we repent of our attitude and we ask God, yes, Holy Spirit, come into our life. Help us to live a life of sacrifice unto you. And Lord, we thank you of making us understand that you have redeemed us, not only just to be your people, we have a responsibility. Our life is to show forth your glory to the world. Thank you, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will continue to renew our mind. Yes, with the knowledge revealed to us, you will continue to cause us to have the mind of Christ and give us the desire of your presence. Help us to be obedient so that we can overcome our flesh and be the holy and blameless people for you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. That's the end of my message for today. Thank you, uh, Sister Josephine, for sharing with us the Word of God this morning on being set apart for God. And uh, we want to thank you for all of you for tuning in this uh, morning for our service. And uh, for those who are watching from uh, Facebook Live, we thank you for joining us. We see you next Sunday at the same time, same channel. Okay, so those of you uh, in the Zoom, please stay back for a while. We stop, uh, stop live stream and then we will have a time of prayer. Okay, just give me a minute.